Hi, welcome to um, this uh, webinar on um, the new advances in lithium dust silicate. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank GC for inviting me to put this presentation on and also for their continued support over the last couple of years in relation to hands-on courses. I'm going to speak to you today on my experiences uh, with the use of lithium dust silicate and why I've chosen to use the LISI system, as well as why I feel that LISI is a huge advancement in the world of uh, lithium dust silicate. First, let me introduce myself because I believe that the experiences that we have lead us to make decisions that we make every day. I grew up in South Africa between the cities of Port Elizabeth and Cape Town. I studied at Peninsula Technicon in Cape Town and went on to work at two labs in Port Elizabeth under technicians who really pushed me to develop my skills over and above anything else. Um, it was at one of these labs in Port Elizabeth of Go Dental that I started my journey with all ceramics. Um, we started off with the use of the Instagram system in the days where we used the slip materials um, and then moved into uh, pressing technologies uh, from when the um, in, uh, from when uh, Ivanclaw launched um, Empress 2. So, So in 2001, I moved to the UK and I thrust myself into ceramics role in London's West End where the demand for high quality work was, uh, was there. And um, I then went into a partnership just outside London, which was my crash course in uh, running a business. And now I run my small bespoke lab from just outside Newquay in Cornwall, where we're closely with both, um, with both local clients uh, and distance clients through the use of photography, couriers, uh, SCL power transfers, and the likes. Now, I believe this path I've taken to where I am now is what leads me to make decisions that I make in, every, in my everyday working environment. I've, I've made plenty of mistakes with all types of materials, and I've been working with pressable strengths for almost 20 years. So believe me, I've made loads of mistakes with lithium dust silicate. But equally, I have now got a standardized procedure in place as a result of these mistakes. And successes these mistakes and successes and I hope that through this talk I can help you to avoid some of the same mistakes that I've made because good judgment comes from experience and sometimes experience comes from bad judgment but obviously if somebody else can have the, make those mistakes and make the bad judgments then hopefully you can avoid making them all together. So during this webinar we are going to touch on uh, the following topics uh, preparation design, uh, ingot selection, Wax-ups, investment, pressing, divesting, trimming, stain and glaze, build-up, and finishing. Now, this is obviously just the uh, protocol for working with uh, with Lacy, and it's just going through a whole couple of cases from beginning to the end. But along the way, I'm going to give you pointers and discuss reasons for why I use this system and why the system is such an advancement on previous lithium dust silicate products. So straight into preparation design and um, these are recommended parameters that um, which take into account minimum thickness, rounded edges and all those things um, that companies want to adhere to. Now these ones are taken from the uh, GC's uh, recommended uh, use. It's just a table that uh, collates all of their figures. Um, uh, but all of the companies have very similar uh, figures as in uh, you know, the different thicknesses uh, and um, ways that we can use these materials. So the cultural press directions for use have exactly the same type of um, uh, thicknesses that we need to adhere to and so uh, do the Emacs uh, ones. Um, now, the thing is, realistically, when we are working with this material, we can't always adhere to these um, to these uh, thicknesses, because quite often we want to do minimally prepped veneers or uh, things like that. So, I think as a guideline, this is fine, but we have to take into account the fact that we are uh, sometimes bonding things in place, and then the strength of the material is actually determined not just by the material, but also by the bonding to the tooth. So we can go down to much finer uh, th thicknesses dependent on whether we're working with a highly skilled clinician or not. Um, if, of course, we're just going to have these uh, 
units uh, cemented into place, then of course we must adhere to these thicknesses because otherwise we'll have catastrophic failures. So to my mind, the most important thing about, uh, about dealing with preparations is that everything is completely rounded off. We cannot have any sharp edges whatsoever. Now, this case that I've completed recently, this is obviously the starting situation, um, and the, uh, the, patient, the patient originally came in wanting straight teeth. We explained to her that she would need to see the orthodontist, but she refused that as an option. So I told the dentist that I wasn't interested in the case if it was going to be prepped for four crowns. Now, this case actually sat on my bench for about two weeks, and I kept on picking it up, wanting to wax it up for diagnostic and putting it back down. And eventually, I realized the reason I didn't want to do this was just simply that the destruction to these teeth would have been immense. So, so I told the dentist that I wasn't interested in the case if it was going to be prepped for four crowns. And luckily, he agreed with me and told the patient that we are not in the business of destroying teeth. So the patient went away, but she came back fairly soon after and agreed that the sensible thing to do was to simply replace the un unsightly crown. She did not want to go through a lengthy, lengthy orthodontic treatment. But we can, but she wanted us to bring it into alignment as much as possible. So what are we going to do here? As I said, I'm not in the business of destroying teeth. So instead we prefer to push the limits of the material. And with Lissy, I have every confidence that I will get a complete pressing with no tension in it and therefore no long-term cracking. We will come back to this case later on, but it's at this point I think it's appropriate to discuss ingot selection and why and how I ended up choosing this, uh, this ingot. I also want you to note, notice that every case I'm talking about here is a real case, and so not every model is absolutely perfect, not every impression is absolutely perfect, but the real cases that, are, that have come through my lab, none of them are showcases, um, you know, and so not everything's going to be absolutely perfect. So ingot selection is possibly, is probably the topic that is asked uh, most about when it comes to press ceramics. And in some ways it is made, uh, made out to be far more complex than it is. What we need to select an, ing an ingot is simply three things. We need the stump shade, we need the desired shade, and we need the material thickness. Once we have these three bits of information, we can apply some very simple techniques to determine which ingot to use. Now, the company has come up with all sorts of formulas and charts to help us determine shade combinations. This is GC's shade combination chart. Ivoclar have developed an app to help with this issue that causes so many headaches. But there's one huge problem. I've never seen a tooth that is an exact replica of a shade guide. And I've certainly never seen a stump that replicates a natural die shape. All of these combination tables and apps point in the direction of achieving the perfect A1, B3, D2, whatever. But in, so instead of using any table or app, I prefer something more visual that I can compare directly to the shade that I've determined through photography or through seeing the patient. I've accumulated wedges of press ingots which I make with plain dental wax as a counter sprue when investing a single unit. They taper to a feathered edge so that I can measure and find the area which is equivalent to my restoration and simply press it into a flat piece of composite which corresponds with the stump shade. I can then clearly see the resulting color of using that ingot. And if it is too dark or too gray or any other issue, I simply try a different ingot in the same, exact same way in this way, I'm certain that even before pressing, that I've correctly dealt with the underlying color. So put it into practice. I wax up to full contour, reduce the wax up to imitate the dentine buildup, and measure the thinnest part of the wax up, which in this case was well below the recommended thickness. I find the equivalent thickness on my sample and apply my sample to the stump shade which should be the dentine shade or a darker shade, uh, shade effect. I would wet the sample piece first to enhance the effect and I make a comparison to the shade that I'm trying to achieve. If I find an MT ingot is usable, then I press this case. If I need to go to an LT or an MO ingot, I would reduce the wax up further where possible. In this case, I used an MT BO ingot or B0 ingot and the stump shade is pretty much an A3 dentine shade. Now, the other important thing to notice here is that when I take a shade, I use this Dragon Shade Guide uh, by Hellman uh, Dental, or Jan Hel Helga Bellman, sorry. 
um, and this influence of the pink onto the um, onto the shade tab makes the world of difference. As you can see in the neck area of this um, of this shade tab compared to the neck area of the uh, of the natural tooth, I think it's an invaluable way of taking shades, and I wouldn't take shade anymore without this pink in place. So hand in hand with ingot selection goes the wax up design. As you can see from the previous slide, the wax up is integral to choosing the ingot. But conversely, the wax up design should be done with respect to the ingot being pressed. So HT ingots are enamel replacement ingots, and in the Ulysses system, they are listed as enamel replacements. So you get E58, E59, exactly the same way as the enamels in the uh, actual uh, ceramic powders are, uh, are labeled. And these uh, correlate very closely with the actual ceramic powders. So, therefore, I would usually uh, use these to full contour or for a very minor cutback. MT ingots can be used in the same way in the posterior region, but in the anterior region, should always have some cutback, as the shade is close to dentine and the opacity between dentine and uh, is between dentine and enamel. So, the LT ingots can be used to simulate dentine and in my opinion always layered although at a real push there could be staining glaze in the posterior region if you're really trying to mask out something dark and mo ingots are more of a block have more of a blocking function and should be fully layered as you would a metal coping in general although the ingots from the lysis are not beautiful and translucent they do tend to block more than the equivalent emax ingots now, this seems to be to be due to the size and density of the crystal structures that would dis and they tend to disperse the light more. So the same crystal structure is the reason for the added strength and the non-putting properties of the Lissy. So as you can see in this diagram that can be found in the Lissy instructions for use, the particle sizes of the um, crystal of the um, lithium silica crystals are so much smaller in Lissy that they don't have as much of an effect when on the surface when we're polishing across the surface and pulling these particles out. They also add more density, which helps with the strength. And as I said, the actual um, it actually helps with the deflection of the light as well, which is really a bonus in that we can use more translucent materials, but yet still mask at the same time. So of course, there's a growing move towards digital. And I have a milling machine, a 3D printer, and a scanner in my own lab. And I accept digital scans from clients. Now, if you don't really do this, or you don't really offer this type of service, it is inevitable that at some point, this is going to become part of your business. Because it's, I'm, I'm noticing it every day, more and more of my clients are uh, pick up the phone and saying, which, um, which oral scanning system do you recommend? So we need to get ourselves ready for this type of uh, type of workflow. Um, and so therefore we need to have protocols for this workflow. And I'm sure that all of the lithium dust manufacturers are going to at some point bring out millable versions of their own ingots, just as we have become used to seeing from Ivoclog Emacs. Now I can't say that I'm a fan of milled ceramics other than zirconia, but for and so for one of the for one the cost of production is high as when you operate a milling machine, you'll realize that it is not just the blacks that cost, but milled ceramics wear burrs quickly, wet milling machines cost more money than, uh, than dry ones and require more maintenance. And chipping of ceramics is a real possibility, especially if you're pushing the boundaries of the materials. For these reasons, I prefer to milling wax or print the um, things into, or print the units into resin and press them. So the digital workflow should be treated exactly the same way as the manual workflow. And full contour should be designed first from where we can make decisions about material and cutback required, taking measurements and using the same ingot selection technique. The wax up can then be milled or printed and adjusted as necessary prior to pressing. This method should give exactly the same amount of control as traditional wax up. In my opinion, digital is here to be embraced and used as yet another tool provides relief from having to worry about the simple parts of the job and rather less is concentrate on perfecting the finishing and aesthetics of the case. Now this is all designed on the Artver lab scanner um, and 
to be honest, the accuracy of what we're getting out and what we are milling from these scans is incredible. I don't believe that we can consistently wax up and press things that are as accurate as this because we all have good days, we all have bad days. But a milling machine and a scanner never has a bad day. They're just there and they can be used, you know, at our whim, however we feel. So there's another case with different issues for ingot selection. Once again, the patient's wish was to have a more even smile. It was decided that two Lissy crowns would be done on the centrals. The upper left one was previously crowned, so it would need to be dealt with in whichever manner necessary with respect to the prep that was already underneath there. But the prep of the upper right one could be controlled and be done more minimally. Unfortunately, the patient did not decide to treat the composite filling, so the overall result is only two central crowns. Um, and it would have been far more pleasant if the patient had allowed the dentist to replace their um, composite fillings as well. As a result of the old and new style of prep, there is a large difference of thickness of material to be used. And this makes controlling the opacity more tricky. So in these cases, I always opt for LT or MO ingots, as it would be possible to control, would be impossible to control this with anything more translucent than this. If we use an empty ingot here, the upper left one would almost certainly look lower in value than the upper right one. So the wax up is done to even up the level of these substructures so we have even layering on both crowns. Due to the light deflection and opacity of the LT ingots, this will give a stable colored core. I then sprue my wax ups and I always try and visualize the path of the molten ceramic has, that the molten ceramic has to flow. The and then sprue it in a way that facilitates the easiest possible flow. So remember that with pressings, there's no thermal center because the heat is continuously being added from the furnace from the outside. So the rules of casting are not relevant when pressing. We can just merely uh, line things up so that we can visualize that the material is going to flow as easily as possible into every extremity of the unit. The important things are do not make material come back in itself. So don't try and put a, um, a crown in so that the material has to travel up and then back down. Always try and visualize the flow to be unidirectional. So lithium disilicate has definitely had an upgrade in the press. So it seems only reasonable that the peripheral products should get the same treatment. The investment is such a great addition to this family of products, but one that I did not immediately get along with. The reason I struggled with this at the beginning was the misuse of the SR spray. I was just not applying correctly and was inadvertently increasing the reaction layer rather than reducing it. So I'm giving you these guidelines so that hopefully you can avoid the same mistakes. Spray from plus minus 15 centimeters. Now, this is really important because if you spray from closer, even as the picture shows, you get an uneven wetting of the surface. And we need to really make sure that the surface is lightly and evenly wet uh, by the spray. This gives us a much more even fill. Blow with compressed air immediately. Don't spray, 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 and then come back and blow. Because once you get to it, it would have really dried out and, and parts would have dried out in thicker areas. And treat one ring at a time for the exact same reasons. So even if you're investing two or three rings, you pick up one ring, Spray what you need to spray, blow off what you need to, blow off what you can. And we're not trying to blow it completely off, we're trying to spread it around as evenly as possible so we can see a nice even thickness of this layer of SR spray on there. And one of the huge advantages of this investment is that it runs like water. Um, so therefore, we have far, le far less risk of creating bubbles or um, you know, or having any issues with the setting uh, on us or getting voids within this, um, this investment mix. Because if something's running like water, we can literally just pour it around as we are, uh, as we're vibrating in. And some people are using this investment without the SR spray, and of course that is absolutely fine. But in my opinion, the SR spray is worth using. So, because it really has, in my opinion, increased the, my chances of getting zero reaction there at all. So this mixing ratio of 15 mL liquid to 10 mL water is what I'm using as a standard. And I'm finding that my fitting, the fitting of my copings and my crowns is really good with this uh, exact mix, uh, mixing ratio. Now I know in the, in the manual that it is recommended 20 to 5, 
Now, I find that that is a very, it gives you a very loose coping. And if that's what you want, that's absolutely fine. But on trawling the internet, I'm finding that more and more people are coming down more towards 50 milliliters to 10 milliliter ratio and finding the same sort of experiences that I have. Some are going 16, some are going 17 milliliters of liquid, but this is something that you need to play with and find what gives you the best results. So although the instructions say 20 to 180 minutes bench set works as well, I get the best results from a 20 minute set time. And then straight into the furnace at 850 degrees Celsius. So because this investment is so strong, we have a much larger area within the ring that we can use for investing. And this means that we can save our materials and we can ensure that our units can be sprued in the best possible way to allow the flow of the material. So again, this is down to finer grain structure and this whole ability of the pouring of the, um, of the strength and of the divesting is all down to the grain structure of this, uh, of this investment. So pressing is where your experience and knowledge really needs to kick in. It's the same as your firing parameters. I can give you the parameters that I use, but you need to apply logic to it as there are many furnaces on the market. These all fire differently and even furnaces of the same brand can be calibrated differently. I've been told that the Zubler furnaces now come, with that, it come standard with the program pre-installed, but in general, I think that the hold time on the manual is too long. I've reduced my hold time to 15 minutes. And if you're finding that your pressings are short, try increasing the temperature, but do this slowly. If you're getting a reaction layer, reduce temperature. Again, do this a little bit at a time. And this article by Toshio Marimoto shows an ingenious way of ensuring that your pressing parameters are set for optimum results. Although through the use and analysis of grid retention wax, this is a method for calibrating your pressing parameters. Obviously, it would be wise to calibrate your furnace first so that you can you always have a reference point to return to. But I believe this article, I believe this article will be published in GC uh, Get Connect magazine, which can be found on GC's website. I highly recommend giving it a read and carrying uh, carrying up your own calibration. Uh, you know, it's not the lightest of um, bedtime reading, but it really is something well worth doing because I think that one of the biggest issues that I've heard spoken about with the LISI is people finding their own parameters. So I use an EP5000 furnace for my pressings and these are my settings. I started with settings according to the manual, but through seeing loads of posts on Facebook, I've tweaked my own settings until I was satisfied with the results. A, a calibration using Toshio Marimoto's method has confirmed these settings for me. Now, you, if you use an EP5000, you will take these settings and have a look at them and try them in your own furnace. I'm not guaranteeing they are going to be correct for you because even furnaces of the same make would vary in your calibration. So you may need to change temperature up or down by a few degrees. So back to the case, and due to the opacity of these LT ingots, we have two units that now have the same base, even though the thickness is different. We now trim and sandblast the substructures to resemble a basic version of the dentine, and although at this stage it appears that you can see the dyes through the copings, you'll note that you seem to be able to see the same amount in both units, even although one is way thicker than the other. It, does, it seems to have somehow made them look like they had given the same effect on the units. So as you can see in this video clip, the investment simply melts away, like as I said, because of this uh, fine particle size. Um, and this is just use of glass beads and the uh, pressure here was, uh, was approximately three bar and absolutely melts away. Now, bearing in mind also, this is a 10-year-old sandblast I'm using. I've never changed those nozzles. So the real pressure hitting that um, investment is probably actually a lot lower than three bar due to the radius that it's uh, hit you at. So, so I can't see the point in, um, in actually separating these units anymore with an investment that, uh, that divests so easily. Um, I just simply remove my uh, Alox plunger, which I still use, and I know that uh, is highly recommended to use uh, the uh, disposal plungers. But I simply remove my Alox plunger, which has been well separated, and I then take straight to Sandblaster 
And I reckon I save a good five minutes just purely by doing it in this way instead of uh, going through the whole process of measuring it, cutting it out with a disc, and then sandblasting it. If you're using a disposable uh, plunger, there's no need whatsoever to even remove the plunger. So all you do is literally take your, you know, once it's cooled, take it straight to the sandblast with glass beads, and in a few minutes you've got this out. There's no need to do any more than what I've done there because you can cut these straight off of the of the ingots um, in in no time whatsoever. So when when I'm separating the units from the sprues and trimming them, we want to keep as keep the generation of heat to an absolute minimum. So I've moved away from using diamond coated metal discs and I knew, now use uh, carborundum discs impregnated with diamond. I trim any bulk using ceramic stones and only do fine detail with diamond coated burrs. I also tend to use diamonds made for surgical use as they have better coating and that keeps them sharper for longer. As blunt burrs can cause a lot of heat and the reason I've moved away from these um, metal discs with the diamonds on is the edge of those metal discs go uh, lose the diamonds so quickly that um, you just can't tell when it's going blunt until you start seeing it going red and then you know you've already put too much heat into it. So if you use carborundum discs they wear down rather than actually going blunt. So you know when to replace your disc and you have no issues of overheating of the, um, of the uh, ceramic or the lithium dust silicon. So the staining and glazing of these um, of lithium dust silicon, the for for me they one of the hardest things to get used to was using uh, luster paste. And this is long before lithium dust silicon or lissy was uh, bought out. I was using luster paste and other products, and I found it really difficult to get the technique for using luster paste right. I watched so many people uh, putting the neutral onto um, onto their units and then massaging all these colors in and I just could not get the hang of this for some reason so I rather started working with the neutral as a carrier for the others for the colors and um, effects and that way I'm still getting my three-dimensional uh, appearance but I don't have this uh, I was getting a very uh, disjointed look of the uh, colors when they went when they were going on so I've made this short video of how I use the luster paste because I didn't really know how to explain it. So I thought I'd make a small video clip that you can watch and see how I use it. And hopefully it helps anybody with their uh, use of luster paste for staining and glazing of lithium dust silicate. So I dispense obviously whatever color I am going to use. I then make this incisor mix, which I always use the B shape for. I use the gum uh, 36 and the L5, which I mix together. And this makes a really good sort of gray, uh, gray translucent shade. You can vary this by adding more blue if you've got a more bluish tinge, or more red if you've got a more reddish tinge down the neck. Um, and then I always uh, the, only part, the only color I don't mix with neutral is the luster value because that I actually want to show the highlights on the cluster tips. So I don't want it to look too much like you can see into it. So I'm mixing the neutral into these two uh, colors as a carrier. Okay. Now this crown I'm going to uh, be showing you here is a Crown that um, it's just a demonstration crown that I had on the bench, and I thought I'd use this method to show you how to use this. So, this is not a live case, it's just a demonstration crown. This is a couple of lines of light that I show at the end of this uh, video. So, I coat everything with the, um, with the liquid that, uh, the, that comes with the uh, kit, and then blow it around so it's evenly coated. And you find that this shade mixed with neutral goes on really easily. It's no, no longer as streaky um, like, like I found it was when you put the neutral on first and then massage the colour into it.
Now I always put color into the um, uh, into the fuse layer as well to increase that look of depth. Now obviously you're going to get some influence from the stump as well, but you should be able to see that from the uh, from the composite shape that I've got under there. I know there was another um, mixture for incisor going around a while back this um, and I still see it on, online learned with um, the, the blue, the grey and the white. Um, now I found that that worked really well for, um, for the blue shades but I couldn't get that, I didn't really like it for darker shades so I developed this um, uh, mixture rather. Uh, that seems to work better for me for pretty much everything. And you just highlight the ridges um, with, um, with the least uh, value. And here we use the um, sort of more intensive colors. I mean, you can use any uh, stains that are suitable for or for the window silicate here. Uh, sometimes I do use the essence part, it really just depends on what uh, I want to achieve. If I really want a dark mahogany color, then I'd probably go to the essence, uh, essence kit for my and use those just in combination with the luster pastes. And then finally, I like to hold the temperature there for the full 90 seconds. I find it get a really good, um, good control of the, uh, or good firing of the test. Uh, and then the glazing simply must be neutral over the entire surface. Um, to see how I control the texture of it in a moment. The thing about staying glazed glazing is the glaze always going to be fixed so you can't control the texture from underneath you have to control it in the actual glaze so I use a hair dryer and I tend to have a little low setting and just as I'm drying it run my brush back through and try to create the texture I want with my brush at this point and that seems to agree well sometimes it takes more than one glaze glaze to achieve this but then you know that's the way we are so to do two, three, maybe even four different shades and um, bakes on, um, on stain shape and stain glaze front. And then exactly the same uh, pattern comes to get in for the glaze. And that's just that result from that, uh, from that sample part. I think you can see the depth that's been created there and just some real cases that were done in the same manner. So the same technique that I used there for um, for staining glaze, I would use as my bonding layer for units that are going to be layered. The entire surface is treated, including areas that are not going to be covered with ceramic. This has two major benefits. First, it provides a perfect bond between the lithium silica core and the ceramic. And second, it allows us to get a head start on placing effects whilst using minimum space. I do not sprinkle my units. Since going on a course with the incredibly knowledgeable August Bruguera, he showed us proof that uh, starting with a rough texture can lead to trapping air in the ceramic, which of course could lead to all sorts of problems in the long term. So instead, I've become used, used to layering onto a shiny surface. And I have to say, it didn't take long to get used to doing this. And I can honestly say the results are far more predictable using this method. So the lineup of uh, the Lissy ceramic is the same as all of the initial ceramics, which is great for if you ever have to build a LC next to a ceramic fused metal or zirconia crown, or if once you have taken a shade, the dentist changed his or her mind about the material to be used. They are labelled in a way that is easy to understand, but I think that, it, that as with every ceramic system out there, 
it is important to not pigeonhole ceramics by the label. For example, cervical translucent is not strictly for use in the cervical region. And incisal or inside materials can be used not only as a base, but also to modify other shades that may need a boost. So just look at each shade as a color in combination with certain translucency. And if you need that color somewhere, then use it regardless of what the label says. So back to the two centers again, I'll go through with you what is fairly standard build-up procedure for me on LT or MO ingots. If these were on MT, I would skip the first stages uh, up to the dentine and replace these colors using luster paste instead. So first I'd place the inside or the FD, or fluorescent, uh, fluorescent dentine, um, the, the inside or FD materials uh, to deflect the light and to control the, um, the deepest colors of the uh, tooth. I then use dentine again. I put this on in an irregular fashion again to help deflect light. Then I use a whole layer of CLF and the CLF is there to obviously replicate the uh, junction between dentine and enamel. Uh, just as the natural tooth has this clear layer in there, we try and replicate that within our crowns. And then I use uh, EOP3 and TMO1 regularly as a mix. And I use the EOP3, depending on how much blue you see, you would add more TMO1 or less TMO1. Now, if the, for example, your distal line angle was more gray and not as blue, then you could replace the TMO1 with TMO5, which is the, the grayish uh, translucent uh, material. I then highlight the um, the uh, the line angle areas as well as the band across the uh, mid third usually, which is uh, normally a little brighter with the EOP one or two, depending on how much brightness I want. And I'll add the layer of either base enamel or enamel with uh, maybe a mix of transfer neutral, uh, depending on what I've seen in my in my shade matching. But you'll note that I leave that window in the um, in the incisal area open and ready for slightly more translucent uh, enamel, which is normally my enamel plus the transfer neutral to show those effects off and uh, let them stand out. I then quite regularly use a cervical translucent in this area where we often have this amber look of uh, in uh, central incisors especially. Um, and you could also use that same CT down at the neck if you wanted to. In this case, I didn't because I felt that the inside material was going to do enough of a job to boost that color. So, as with most of uh, my all ceramic work, the palatal area is on full contour, so I do not have to worry about the bite at all, and I concentrate 100% on the aesthetics of this case. And this is my standard first bake lissy. I have. To I like to have a fairly long dry time, so I'm certain that there is no moisture left uh, before the furnace closes, and a hold of one minute is fairly standard. However, if if uh, these prem if I had a lot of um, units in the furnace, I would raise that hold time and I would raise the preheat time. Um, so these are the two parameters that I would play with the most. I don't really play with my top temperature, I always play with my hold time rather, because I know that that top temperature is going to fuse the ceramic. But if I have more ceramic, then I want to lengthen that hold time. If I have less ceramic, then I can reduce that hold time. But generally speaking, for a first bake, a normal first bake procedure, that hold time is one minute, unless I fill the entire tray with, um, with units. So the result after the first bake, which I then fit to a solid model with gingerbread present, or, or I work on an alveola model in order to determine the best shaping of these units. I do a basic trim back using diamond burrs. Again, the dentist type of burrs, because once again, they last so much longer. They might be a little more expensive, but they last about three or four times longer than the ones that sell to us in the lab. And uh, I do this on this, uh, on this model with gingerbread present to get the portions right and ready for the next bake. I then have the op option of performing yet another internal stain procedure. This is one of the simplest ways of introducing sharp effects such as hairline cracks. I use a mixture of luster paste and in vivo stains 
And if necessary, I can even uh, bring in stains from other compatible systems like the Essence particles from the Emacs kit. So I'll perform a quick firing to set the stain. If I've used luster paste, then I will use vacuum. I know that this is not strictly speaking necessary, but luster paste is a ceramic and I prefer to fire it with vacuum. And if I've only used oxides uh, for a couple of small effects, then I wouldn't worry with the vacuum. I'd just literally take it up its temperature and drop it straight back down. And once these colors have been set into place, I can perform the final buildup. In this case, it was a very simple buildup uh, utilizing only transfer neutral and a thin edging of uh, dentine to emulate a halo. But this again is a decision that is made based on the shade that you uh, that you have. Sometimes the best option is to use the enamel neat and other times a mix of enamel with transfer neutral which gives the ideal result. So back into the furnace, so you notice that the high temperature is the same as the first bake, but I vary the time spent at this temperature according to the amount of ceramic that has been added. If it was only perhaps the line angles that had been bulked up, I might use just 10 seconds hold. If I was firing multiple units and they all had a large second build, then I might hold for as long as 50 seconds. In this case, I had a hold time of 20 seconds, and the units here uh, were then ready for trimming up and finishing off. So I simply trimmed, added texture, and polished. Although in hindsight, in this case, I should have polished more. Um, unfortunately, in the shade photos I was uh, in possession of, the teeth were dehydrated and I was not made aware of this. So you'll see shortly that, I've that had I polished further or glazed, the result would have been superior. But according to the photographs that I had, it looked as though this was the texture that was uh, present. So in cases where I do glaze, this is the gla uh, firing site that I use, and I will use back. I will use vacuum once again if I'm using luster paste. Although I very seldom use luster paste at this stage. If I'm doing a small correction add on at the same time, I would also use vacuum. But most of the time, I'll simply do an air glaze with no vacuum at all. I then give it a final hand polish prior to packing and sending the job for a trying. And it's really important that we say trying because we need to get this uh, get this philosophy right with our clients that it's never a fit appointment, it's always a trying appointment. Because that way the patient becomes willing to work with us and if, if we need to make alterations, they are more open to allowing us to make these alterations. Quite often when we uh, say fit appointment to clients, they the uh, patient would go in there expecting the client to fit it and they would accept something that was not necessarily 100%. So they wouldn't, you know, they weren't getting the best out of it purely because they were in a rush and we weren't getting the job satisfaction out of it. So it's far better to tell your clients and get them to tell their patients that that point is a trying appointment. That way it's only a bonus if they get it fitted. So this is the results of the two centrals and I really do wish that they'd been returned to me for higher shine and polish. But the patient is happy, so I guess that's what counts. And the result of the minimal space MT, MT unit. But really, this is the photo that counts. So as you can see, this material really does sit well in the oral environment. It plays with the light perfectly. Often crowns can look good but with the, with the refractive view. But what counts is that when you step back and see it as it is intended to be used, that it just blends in. Once the shadow of lip is added, we do not want this crown to suddenly look grey. And I think that in this situation, it would be hard to uh, walk, up some, walk, walk up to her in the street and say she had a crown in her mouth. So, of course, we don't only use Lissy for single centrals or small cases. Sometimes we need to use it in combination with other materials. And it's really important that the mix of materials still looks to be a unity. Most commonly these days, I use alongside zirconia units. And when I do, if the zirconia units are singles or small bridges with minimal layering, I will simply layer both the Lissy Press and the Zirconia with Lissy Ceramic and fire them together. I have no issue with doing this and both the Lissy Press and the Zirconia will use a bonding layer of luster paste so we are working from the same stable base. Here is another example of the same process. Lissy could not be used on the front four units as they were vertical preps and Zirconia was not an option in my opinion on the canines of pre-motors as they were veneers. So we had to create this mix once again. But once again, you can't really tell the difference between the Lissy and the Zirconia. And yet another example where we have cantilever bridge. Um, 
and we're raising the patient's bite, so I didn't want this bridge to be done in uh, in a lithium disilicate. I felt more comfortable with it being done in zirconia. But again, we have a mixture of lissy and zirconia, and we have a blend. Now, what about lithium disilicate as Maryland bridges? Well, in this case, or in cases like this, where the bite is perhaps not a huge issue, and we can wax up large portions of the unit, it can be a real advantage as we no longer run the risk of discoloring the retaining tooth. This material's ability to be bonded at such high strength is also a clear advantage for this type of treatment. So although this will not be found in the list of applications, you cannot give a guarantee with it. For some discerning patients, it may well be the best solution. And I've done absolutely loads of these, and I can tell you that the success rates are very high. But of course, you should only agree to do them if you feel that you have the space required and if you, you the dentist, and most importantly, the patient are happy that is a risk that you are taking. And of course, LISI can be used for implant work in conjunction with tie bases. These, these have been done using MO0 as their base and then entirely layered. Although, to be honest, these days I tend to use zirconia in this situation. I do think that zirconia is probably a slightly better material for this uh, type of uh, situation. But if you are in a situation where you have a press furnace and no milling furnace, um, this is a real uh, option. So now to wrap up, I thought I would share with you something that has uh, created a little bit of a buzz of late. I was meeting, uh, I was at an, in a meeting recently where we were chatting about the use of Lissy as press over zirconia material. And I didn't really see the point. That is until I went away and really thought about it. Now it is not something that I'm currently doing. So Bill Murray kindly allowed me to use these images of case study posts on, uh, recently on Facebook. You can see clearly how it's using the zirconia as the dentine and then pressing the enamel over the top. Now, this is something that is unique to Lissy Press uh, uh, as the HT ingots are based on the enamel shades rather than the dentine shades and does not in any way copy the press over technique from Emacs. As with Emacs, their press over material is not lithium disilicate and therefore only the strength of the layered ceramic. Where I see this technique as a has value is to replace multi-layered zirconia, which in my opinion is not at all aesthetic. And actually the strength is not particularly impressive either. With multi-layered uh, materials or zirconia materials, we have horizontal banding of opacities and strength, which does not emulate nature at all. However, with this technique, the core strength of the zirconia will be 1,200 megapascals and an outer layer of over 500 megapascals. And the positioning of the opacities truly emulate nature. Also, the position of the strength is far more realistic as to where we need it. The 1,200 megapascals covers the entire, uh, the entire preparation, and then you have 500 megapascals wrapping that whole lot up. So that, to me, makes far more sense than uh, any sort of multi-layered zirconia ever would, because multi-layered zirconia really uh, is only the strength of the weakest part of it because of this horizontal banding. And that generally is around about five, uh, 600 megapascals anyway. So I think that this, is a, this probably has got legs and I think you need to watch this space because I do think that this is something that's going to be used more and more over the, last, over the next few years. So I'd like to thank you all for your um, attention and for uh, you know, staying with me through this uh, uh, last 50 minutes or so of this uh, lecture. So, but I'd now like I'd like to welcome any uh, questions and we can have a discussion as to what it is, anything that you would like to uh, find out about Lissy. So if there's any questions to be uh, asked, then yeah, I welcome them and you can uh, type your uh, uh, questions into the box. Oh, thank you, Anton, that's uh, very kind of you. Uh, but really, you know, as say, any questions, I welcome them and I'm happy to uh, discuss with you. That's a pleasure, Uga. Yeah.
And thank you, Judith, for staying with me on that as well. So, Brian Perkin asks, what would my preference uh, be towards plungers disposable allocs? Uh, as I said, uh, Brian, um, you know, I, I am using allocs at the moment. I've heard a lot of good things about the disposables and the recommendation is towards disposables. I suppose when my allox ones wear out, then I will go on to disposables. But at the moment, I'm finding that if you um, if you are really using the um, separators well with the allox plungers, you don't have any problems. But I think a lot of people are having cracking of their uh, of their ingots with the um, allox plungers, mostly because they're not using the separators properly. Um, so I don't really have a personal preference at the moment. But uh, you know, in my opinion, you can use both. But um, the recommendation is definitely disposable from the company. So, and uh, Mike uh, Richter has asked, would you recommend Lissy Press crowns on peak on big implant cases? Well, really, uh, that's something I, I don't really do myself. Obviously, that's saying that uh, possibly, uh, you know, Phil Rainton or Lee Mullins would be able to help you with a bit more. Um, that's their sort of uh, thing that they've been doing. I, for me, it's not really a big thing. Um, I'm not entirely uh, convinced of the um, bonding to peak as yet. So I think I would stick to doing, um, still doing um, a composite on peak for myself at this point in time. So, I mean, the other option, obviously, of course, is uh, possibly zirconia on peak. There's lots lots of use of peak going on. I would like to see, actually, maybe another sort of five years of uh, results of big cases on peak, make sure that nothing breaks down, all that sort of thing, before I make that uh, decision to move in that direction. So there any uh, any if there's any more questions, then please I can great to so I just can't see that whole question there. So you can see these whole thing. So you lost people having issues with the pressing. Okay, so uh, Lee Jones has uh, said that she's been using Lissy for a while now and she see lots of people having issues with the pressing cycle however she hasn't experienced any herself any comment on this yet i mean the comment is really that the pressing cycle is going to be something that is uh, determined by your furnace really um by your own techniques you i think we've all become so attuned to having just one pressable ceramic on the market that we just took their word as for, as the way it was and we accepted having things like um reaction layer but with Lissy, the whole point is to find this fine-tuning uh, part, this fine-tuned um, pressing parameters that we can not have reaction layer and not have short pressing. So we've kind of narrowed this um, field of what's acceptable down a bit. And um, I, I think that really it's just people not applying their knowledge of, um, of how to adjust programs. And I think if they have to go and read that uh, article that I showed you within the lecture and calibrate the furnace according to the product that they are pressing, that they will no longer have any problems. There is definitely no problem with pressing uh, of lithium disilicate, of any of the lithium disilicates. They, they all press, it's just they all have to have slightly different um, parameters to press. So it's more user error than actual product error, I would say. And thank you, uh, Andrew Kim, that's uh, very, uh, good of you. Um, if, any more questions at all? What ingots we use over metal posts or very dark shades? So, so I, that's actually a really good question. So I would actually meant to sort of uh, uh, talk about when we were talking about the uh, ingot selection. Gary Jones, he's asked what ingots I would use over metal posts or very dark shade stumps. Now, the MO ingots do tend to work very well for these. Um, as I said, the way that these ingots deal with light is uh, quite uh, quite is really good actually and so you don't need as much opacity as you would if you were pressing with an Emax ingot so the MO0 ingot would be my choice to generally press over metal posts 
or very dark shaded stumps. Now, if the stump was completely black, then I would say, you know, you are going to have to go to the HO and get from Emacs still. Um, that would be something that I think could be added to the system over the next few years that would really help. Um, and the other one ingot that is possibly missing at this point is an LT bleach ingot, which I think would really help to be added into it. But generally speaking, you can do pretty much everything uh, with with these ingots. Maybe just keep your drawers for the time being uh, an H one or two HO zeros from uh, Ivoclan that would help you with absolutely black stumps where you have very little space. But in general, as I say, the MO0 ingots would mask almost everything. Okay, and uh, thank you, Lars, as well. Okay, so if there's no other questions, then um, I'd like to just say thanks again for uh, staying on with me and uh, participating. Um, and uh, until next time. Oh, wait, sorry, there was one more there. Which ingots would you use for monolithic posterior crowns, LT or MT? So uh, I would tend to use MT, but it would depend on the um, on the darkness of the stump shade. Uh, MT would be my first choice. If it was a full contour crown, but if it was just a small section of uh, enamel being replaced, then it would be an HT. So, but I'd go to LT as an absolute last resort. Okay, but um, so if there's but if there's no more questions coming through, then um, I'm going to sign off and thank you again. Uh, for listening. Thanks.